Welcome to the Alaska Weather Show on this Tuesday, May 4th, 2021. I'm meteorologist Peter Chan coming to you from the Weather Service in Anchorage. And as always, if you want additional weather information provided uh, with this program, you can go to weather.gov forward slash Alaska. Or if you want a recorded forecast by phone 1-800-472-0391. And taking a look at uh, our current situation with the river breakup, uh, it is the breakup season and things continue to progress, especially uh, the rivers that are uh, south of the Yukon, as we'd expect with the warmer temperatures that we've experienced here now the past couple of weeks. Uh, many areas are beginning to open up, though we still have some areas that, uh, that you see highlighted in uh, magenta that are not known as far as what the uh, current ice conditions are. But nevertheless, uh, reports have been given the fact we haven't been quite as warm as last week and that the nighttime temperatures are st still getting down to around or a bit below freezing that has slowed some of the melting so we're not uh, indicating any major problems at this point but nevertheless uh, we can use your reports we need your help so what we want are spotter reports if you live along or passing along one of these rivers or better yet if you're flying over and can cover a broader area uh, please uh, let us know what you see. You can send pictures or videos uh, uh, to uh, nws.ar.aprfc at noaa.gov. And if you notice something more serious, uh, a notable ice jam or any type of flooding or something unusual, please call our 1-800-847-1739 number and uh, one of the forecasters with the River Forecast Center would be happy to hear from you to help them uh, make some assessments as they make decisions regarding forecast and potential for issuing any type of advisories or warnings. Otherwise, on the hazardous weather map, uh, there are no uh, immediate hazards as they pertain to weather, such as winter weather advisories or things like that. But nevertheless, as we head uh, through uh, the midweek, we continue to see a few weather systems that are going to be impacting areas of south central Alaska along the southeast coast as well as in the north and along the Aleutian chain. So let's first take a look at a curl of cloud cover there that's uh, off of Kodiak Island. That's a little area of low pressure that's uh, pivoted on off toward the south and east. That's the same one that produced uh, some snow showers as far south and west as Dutch Harbor yesterday. Meanwhile, there's still a fair amount of moisture out over the uh, southern portion of the Gulf of Alaska associated with another area of low pressure that will be lifting northward and uh, affecting portions of uh, the southeast panhandle as we head through midweek with some additional rainfall. You can see that moisture creeping northward. Meanwhile, moisture lingers south of the Yukon River across the interior, especially along the Alaska Range, and that is where we'll see some scattered uh, light rain showers in the mountains areas. You'll see snow showers and then farther north Lower cloudiness along the north slope. Uh, temperatures have failed to get above freezing and up there. They're seeing patchy light snow along with some areas of freezing fog that will persist uh, into the day tomorrow. And then further west, you can see the enhanced cloud cover with an occluded front that's working its way across the central Aleutians into the eastern Aleutians. And that feature will continue to bring uh, some light precipitation to those areas as yet another push of low pressure will be arriving from further south of the Aleutians here as we head into Thursday. So t uh, in today's late afternoon, early evening weather map, you can see low pressure that continues to linger across the interior of the southern part of the state and that low that's uh, south of Kodiak Island and off of the southwest peninsula in the North Pacific. Uh, meanwhile, high pressure though is still entrenched from the Arctic Ocean back toward eastern Russia and then we also see that occluded front working and lifting uh, northward of the Aleutians. As we go in uh, to late tonight, early tomorrow morning, still uh, troughiness lingers across the interior of the southern half of the state, bringing some scattered light rain, snow, and mixed showers. A uh, little ridge of high pressure could actually cause uh, skies to break up a bit in the southeast, perhaps a little patchy frost, not out of the question. 
around Haynes or Skagway. Otherwise, out toward the west, we are looking at a fair amount of moisture, though it be light precipitation associated with a few areas of low pressure that are going to consolidate into one here as we go into the day on Wednesday. You'll also note uh, south of uh, Haida Gwahi that there is that low pressure that's lifting northward up toward the southeast uh, uh, coastline and that will have a tendency to uh, to produce some additional rainfall as we go into Wednesday. But still some moisture lingers along and south of the Yukon River for Wednesday afternoon. With it expect some scattered uh, rain showers and in along the Alaska range they could be a mix uh, mixed bag of showers or some light snow showers still in the higher elevations and then on Thursday we are looking for uh, southeast Alaska there is an occluded front lift north northward to be areas of light rain and rain showers also across um, the interior up to about the Alaska range we will see uh, again some additional showers or mixed snow showers as we get into the higher elevations and then finally Low pressure out there back toward the central and eastern Aleutians will kind of consolidate with a, an occluded front wrapping around that, keeping the precipitation going across those areas. So low temperatures tonight will generally be above freezing, with the exception of once you get into the southeast interior uh, toward Glen Allen and uh, on over by McGrath. But otherwise, everybody else should generally be in the mid to upper 30s. High temperatures for tomorrow will generally be in the 50s, mid 50s across the southeast and also low to mid 50s uh, the valleys uh, the warmer valleys there of the interior with along the coast reading staying in the 40s to near 50 degrees thursday morning we'll see low temperatures in the southeast uh, actually up into the 40s with the cloud cover and rain that's moving through whereas in the southeast interior we'll see lows dipping a little bit below freezing especially up around uh, as we get toward Telkeetna in those areas and then extending down toward the southwest. Now temperatures on Thursday afternoon will get back up into the 50s across much of the region so just slightly milder, fairly typical for this time of year. Could squeak out of 60 at Juneau. And then across the Arctic coast readings uh, early tomorrow morning on Wednesday will be in the single digits to around 10 above. Whereas once we get into the interior, uh, temperatures on Wednesday afternoon will be back up into the lower to mid 50s along and south of the Yukon River, helping to facilitate additional uh, ice melt there on the rivers. Meanwhile, uh, low temperatures again will be down around 10 above along the Arctic coast Thursday morning and generally below freezing in the 20s across the interior. And temperatures again similar below freezing in the 20s along the Arctic coast, but then warming into the lower to even a few upper 50s, 58 at Fairbanks. And then as we head into the southwest for uh, Wednesday morning, we are looking for low temperatures in the interior, getting down into the uh, upper 20s to around 30 degrees, also heading out toward the uh, uh, Yukon Delta. And then as we extend off the peninsula, temperatures will stay in the mid and upper 30s for lows. And as we go through Wednesday afternoon, uh, places like McGrath will still get up to about 53 and uh, as we look uh, toward uh, the western areas along the coast of west coast they're staying below 40 in the upper 30s and then on Thursday morning low temperatures in the interior down around freezing but elsewhere uh, look for lows generally uh, in the mid 30s to near 40 degrees extending outward along the uh, southwest peninsula into the Aleutians. And temperatures Thursday afternoon should across much of the interior uh, of both uh, the Kuskokwim and the Yukon rivers should be back up into the 50s for a little milder weather. And if we take a quick check of uh, what we have for our extended outlook May 10th through the 14th, we are looking for above normal temperatures uh, to settle in through the heart of the Yukon Valley. So that will further uh, facilitate the melting that will help uh, ensure the, the river breakup that is currently underway. And as far as any precipitation that we have coming up here, uh, precipitation could end up being a bit above normal, a little on the uh, above normal side here across the southwest, including uh, Bethel and over toward Dillingham and Dutch Harbor. And that seems to kind of mirror the trend that we've seen with the low pressure systems that have been kind of riding up through uh, there along and just south of the Aleutians. So we expect that trend to continue with just maybe a little warmer weather uh, settling up here through the interior of Alaska here as we head into next week. So that does it for your public weather segment, and uh, we'll have additional aviation and marine weather coming up.
And now, aviation weather around Alaska. And now it's time for the aviation weather segment of the show and the flying weather as we're anticipating for your planning purposes on Wednesday. Uh, we are looking for uh, in the morning hours, uh, IFR conditions across the North Slope and Arctic Coast, even though high pressure is located just north of there, it's keeping uh, some uh, light freezing fog and a few areas of a little bit of light snow or flurries lingering. Also, IFR conditions uh, out there over the Seward Peninsula and then out over much of the Aleutian chain there across the Bering Sea. And going into uh, Wednesday afternoon, we do anticipate IFR conditions to hold there along the North Slope as well as much of the central uh, Bering Sea on and, and across the central and eastern Aleutians. Going into Thursday morning, still IFR conditions are anticipated across uh, the North Slope, extending inland uh, across the Seward Peninsula, uh, all the way southward uh, through much of the central Bering and across uh, the central and eastern Aleutians beginning to creep upward into the tip of the Southwest Peninsula. And Thursday afternoon, generally better conditions should prevail across uh, much of the Alaska interior and the southeast panhandle, while IFR conditions uh, hold there from uh, uh, the Bering Strait and then also down along and north of the uh, eastern half of the Aleutian chain. So past conditions on Wednesday. At Anatubic, we are expecting IFR conditions, especially uh, the north entrance and on the north slope, but areas uh, the south entrance and southward should see uh, MVFR conditions uh, that return there for the afternoon. Same thing for Adigan, IFR conditions, north entrance and holding throughout the day across the north slope, but improving to MVFR at Adigan and even better conditions as you get farther south. And looking farther south and west, Lake Clark and Merrill will enjoy VFR conditions throughout the day on Wednesday. And areas uh, rounding uh, the Alaska range, we are looking for Rainy Pass to be VFR, as should Windy and Isabel Pass as be VFR during the day on Wednesday. Farther east, Mentasta VFR also expected, and dropping toward the southwest, Tanita also enjoying uh, VFR conditions throughout the day, as will Portage. And then finally, there in the uh, uh, at least uh, southeast panhandle, Chilkoot and White should start out with MVFR conditions improving to VFR by Wednesday afternoon. And a look at the freezing levels across the interior, especially the Yukon Valley, 2,000 feet plus. Areas of the southeast uh, will generally be between two to around 4,000 feet for freezing levels. And you can see out in the west with that frontal system and area of low pressure, ahead of it will be the highest freezing levels across the eastern Aleutians, well, they'll be, their uh, freezing levels are anticipated to be 6,000 feet plus there on Wednesday morning. Now, icing potential for the interior between 5 and 15,000 feet, as there will be some widely scattered light rain showers developed there for uh, the afternoon. There could even be a rumble of isolated thunder in uh, far east uh, central areas with some cumulus buildups. Otherwise, uh, the northern uh, Gulf of Alaska along the south central coast into the southeast, there's a potential for some uh, isolated moderate uh, icing between 5,000 and 12,000 feet. And then out, uh, out over the eastern Aleutians and western Aleutians for that matter, between 8 and 16,000 feet. Check at the jet stream level winds, uh, weak low pressure circulation off Kodiak Island with uh, areas of the southeast seeing uh, southwesterly, south to southwesterly winds upwards of 60 to 75 knots. Out across the uh, tail end of the Alaska Peninsula, northwest winds upwards to 100, 100 knots with that upper level jet core. And elsewhere, winds relatively light, getting down to uh, 9,000 feet. We see a couple circulations of low pressure uh, there south, just south of the Gulf of Alaska with onshore uh, flow at 9,000 feet from the south of uh, 40 to 50 knots, uh, Haida Gwahi into uh, the southeast and then further west out across the eastern uh, Lucians, we see winds from the south-southwest of 40 to near 50 knots. And then bringing it down to 3,000 feet, weak high pressure circulation over the southwest with low pressure uh, off of Haida Gwahi there in the southeast with uh, south winds of 40 to 50 knots. And then as we go over to the eastern Aleutians, the far southwestern tip, we are looking for uh, south uh, winds of, of upwards to 45 knots. And finally, a quick check of turbulence. 
uh, surface to 3,000 feet possible there, eastern Aleutians, isolated area of surface to 4,000 there south of Kodiak Island, and surface to 5,000 feet there in the southeast. That does it for your flight planning weather. On March 11, 2011, a powerful tsunami hit Japan, destroying cities and villages. As the water receded back into the ocean, it pulled what remained of buildings, cars, boats, and homes along with it. Scrap metals, plastics, and objects of all shapes and sizes either sank near the shore or floated away. In the days that followed, large masses of floating debris could easily be seen by satellite imagery and aerial photos. In the wake of this disaster, NOAA is assessing the potential impact that the debris may have on U.S. shores. So, where will this debris go, and when will it get there? To help answer those questions, Scientists are using computer models to estimate the debris path, using its starting location in the tsunami zone and historical weather and ocean conditions. The findings are that some debris could pass near or wash ashore in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands as early as this winter. Debris may also approach the west coast of the United States in 2013 and potentially circle back to the main Hawaiian Islands in 2014. But scientists caution that there are limitations to what computer models can tell us. Now that the debris has moved out of satellite view, and with currents and winds in the Pacific constantly changing, there is no guarantee that the debris will stay on the predicted path. Items will sink along the way, or break up and disperse in many directions. Despite these unknowns, NOAA and its partners are collecting data, assessing possible impacts, and making preparations in case debris does wash ashore. The 2011 tsunami in Japan reminds us that the devastation that happens on land can also become a marine debris issue at sea. Imagine all of this underwater. In a major tsunami, it could happen. In this part of Washington state, it's happened before, hundreds of years ago. Sometime in the future, it will likely happen again. But we can be ready. If a tsunami strikes, this school will provide a place for people to ride it out above the waves. We're in Westport, Washington, and right behind me is the very first tsunami vertical evacuation center in the United States. Tsunamis are a potential hazard for low-lying coastal areas. That's why many coastal communities have plans in place to get people to safety, high ground or inland, where they can be beyond the reach of a tsunami. Often there are signs showing where to go and where to gather. Most tsunamis are caused by underwater earthquakes along subduction zones, where two of Earth's plates collide and one is forced under the other. Westport and other Pacific Northwest coastal communities are especially at risk because one of these zones lies just offshore. It's called the Cascadia Subduction Zone. An earthquake here caused a tsunami in 1700 that flooded shores as far away as Japan. Experts say it's just a matter of time before it happens again. Since the subduction zone is so close, a tsunami like the one in 1700 could strike before people in some low-lying areas could get to high ground or inland. And Westport doesn't have a lot of high ground or easy routes inland. If we get an earthquake or a tsunami, we're gonna get a lot of water in the area really quickly, and we needed a place to go. So our community built this brand new school and above our gym and cafeteria, 
we have a roof, and so the idea is that we'll get all of our students up, and anybody from the community who needs to get up, they can get up there as well. Ocosta Elementary School might seem like a normal school, but look more closely. It's engineered to withstand monster waves. Tsunami vertical evacuation shelters must be able to resist the powerful forces that a tsunami brings. Hydrodynamic, buoyant, hydrostatic, and debris impact forces and strong currents. They're also designed to help people get to safety quickly. There are four big staircases on each corner of the building, and each one of those staircases is eight feet wide, and we can get the whole school evacuated in about four and a half minutes. Everybody should be at a zero. On the roof of the building, there is water and food and buckets and shelters and tarps and blankets and different things so that we can be up there for two, three, maybe four days while we wait for rescue. You can go to the top and you know you'll be safe. It, it feels really nice to have a special building because you feel protected. This community decided that a tsunami evacuation center was important because they didn't have anywhere to go and they decided to use their money to build the building the additional cost is anywhere between 10 and 20 percent of the actual building cost itself and that's really a sound investment for a lot of protection you may be there a while but you're safe and you're secure and that's the most important thing And now, marine weather around Alaska. And now it's marine weather time and today's sea ice edge. We continue to watch uh, the ice uh, breaking up and as we would expect, uh, so far the winds have not been exceptionally strong but there still is a potential uh, for some areas to be uh, moving at least uh, initially toward the west a bit over the eastern bearing the ice that remains, uh, Nunavak Island and just south of there. Uh, in advance of an occluded uh, front that will be passing just south of the region. Otherwise, uh, we do expect a, a continuation of the ice to just continue to melt and break up uh, across the Bering Sea and surrounding coastal areas. Uh, the extended outlook that takes us into next week uh, is favoring temperatures to average uh, above normal, especially across the Alaskan interior, so this will only help to further along that process. But looking at the marine weather forecast for Wednesday for the southeast. Uh, we are looking for the inner waterways to have winds uh, out of the north, northwest, 10 to 15 knots, waves running around a few feet. But areas out along the coast there, the Gulf, will see winds out of the east, upwards of 15 to near 25 knots, highest waves, southern half, 7 to 8 feet. And more easterly winds, uh, Yakutat westward, uh, producing waves or swells around 6 to 7 feet. As low pressure draws nearer, on Thursday, we'll see winds picking up, especially there along the southern uh, coastal areas. Interior waterways, uh, winds will turn southeasterly 25 knots, eight footers there around Ketchikan. Uh, and then areas uh, to the west of there along uh, the, the Gulf, we'll see easterly winds of 30 to 35 knots, waves up to 14 feet. And then in the northern areas, the uh, Lynn Canal will see northerly winds 25 knots, 5 footers, and the area west of uh, Yakutat will be out of the north at 15 knots and waves around 5 feet. Across south central areas, uh, winds will be out of the north and uh, northeast. Uh, Prince William Sound around 10 knots, waves a couple of feet, and as we go down the length of Cook Inlet, generally northerly winds uh, at 10 knots, turning more easterly at the mouth of Cook Inlet with waves running a few feet. And off of Kodiak Island, uh, northeast to east winds 15 knots, swells around 5 feet. On Thursday, uh, winds will try to turn a little more northeasterly across the inner water waves, Prince William Sound and much of Cook Inlet with waves only running a couple of feet. But uh, notice uh, there in the, the uh, 
mouth of Cook Inlet and just north of uh, Kodiak Island, winds will be uh, westerly at about 15 knots and waves a few feet. Then finally, as we get out into the Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island, winds initially will be out of the east-northeast around 20 knots in many areas with waves uh, around 6-7 feet on the Pacific Gulf side and 4-6 to six feet on the Bering side. And then as the occluded front approaches from the west on Thursday, we'll see a generally more of an easterly flow set up, uh, anywhere from 20 upwards to 30 knots uh, as we get toward Cold Bay and False Pass with seas building to 9 to near 10 feet there. Otherwise, the inner, inner waters there around Kodiak Island should uh, be out of the east at 10 knots and a few feet. And then the Aleutian chain, look for those easterly winds ahead of the front, upwards to 30 knots and waves around 10 feet on each side, whether it be the Bering or North Pacific. And then on further west, uh, especially Kiska to Shimia, we're looking for northeasterly winds, 15 knots. And as that low lifts up near and just east of Adak on Thursday, we will see uh, winds uh, shift to the south, uh, uh, the eastern half of the Aleutians, with waves running around 10 feet, while turning more to the north-northwest on the backside of the low, the western half of the Aleutians, with waves 8 to about 11 feet. And across the west coast, the ice continue to break up. Uh, winds uh, out of the east at St. Paul and St. George uh, at 20 knots, with waves around 6 feet. And then as we go into Thursday, we'll see east, northeast winds, strongest there, uh, open waters there around St. Paul, St. George, up to 35 knot gales, 13 footers. And uh, across the uh, broken ice there, we will see winds out of the north, northeast, anywhere from 10 upwards to 25 knots off of Nunavik Island. And then along the Arctic coast, uh, winds will be out of the northeast to east, uh, 10, 10 knots or so there, and along uh, the Seward Peninsula out of the northeast at 15 knots and as we go into Thursday easterly winds at 15 knots along the Arctic coast and areas around Wainwright, Point Lay, Cape Lisburn could be out of the east northeast upwards at 20 to 25 knots. So that does it for your marine weather. Thanks for watching. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.